Hi, I'm Tom and Homi from Dell EMC. In this demonstration, I'm going to show you the integration between Dell EMC Parse Store and VMware vSphere 7 Update 1 with VMware Tenzu. VMware has announced vSphere 7 Update 1 introducing VMware vSphere with Tenzu. This brings a new possibility to run containers and Tenzu Kubernetes grid clusters without the need to go via vCloud Foundation. This means that admins will be able to set up and use Kubernetes and containers within their organizations just within vSphere. The good news is that NSX or vSAN are not required, so admins don't need to revamp completely their infrastructure to accommodate the vSphere container workload platform, and they can use any block storage and more specifically vVols. So first of all, let's take a look at the vSphere environment. As you can see here, I'm running vCenter and ESXi 7 update 1. If we navigate to the workload management tab and click on add cluster, we can now see that we can create a new vSphere with Tanzu cluster and choose between NSXT or regular vCenter server network based on DB switches. For the purpose of this demo, I already created the cluster and the first namespace, Tomer and S01. If I click on it, I can see the namespace details and statistics, and by clicking on Edit Storage button, we can add or remove storage policy based management policies. One of the new features that was added in vSphere 7 is the ability to provision virtual volumes to back Kubernetes persistent volumes, PVs, via the updated version of the vSphere Container Storage Interface, the CSI driver. In this video, I will walk you through the steps involved in consuming Dell EMC parse store vVols via Kubernetes manifest files when dynamically provisioning persistent volumes. In the vSphere host and clusters view, we can find the TKG cluster I deployed in advance, which consists of one master and five worker nodes. Under the related objects tab, we can see that this TKG cluster is running on Vivol Data Store. By navigating to the Parster UI and clicking on the Compute tab, we can see the Parster detects the TKG virtual machines and we can find really useful information not only about the storage but about the virtual machine's performance metrics as well. By clicking on the Vivols tab, we can see the different virtual volumes for that specific virtual machine, the config, swap, and data file. In addition to the virtual machine files, every time we create a new Kubernetes application with a persistent volume running on this TKG cluster, a new dedicated volume will be created representing the Kubernetes persistent volume object. Now, let's connect to our vSphere with Kubernetes cluster using kubectl command and then change the context to my namespace and create a new application. As you can see, the storage policy I added to this namespace is represented as Kubernetes storage class. For the purpose of this demo, I'm creating a new MySQL instance using Helm and specifying the storage class for this application. Within a few seconds, we can see that the new pod is up and running directly on the ESXi host and connected to its persistent volume. Now, let's navigate to the vCenter container volume view and see what information we can find there. One of the main advantages of running Kubernetes on top of vSphere is the insight we receive via CNS, cloud native storage. Rather than having to keep switching between arrays views and data store content views, we can view all the information relevant to persistent volumes consuming vSphere storage in one place. Using vVols has no difference. Here we can see the persistent volumes view showing our persistent volume in the vSphere UI. We can see the persistent volume name. We see that it is on the vVol data store, which is compliant with the storage policy and we can also see the health status and the capacity. If we click on the details icon, 
under the basics view, there is more information such as the type of the volume, the storage policy, and the volume ID. We see more information about Kubernetes objects such as the different labels, the name of the pod, and the namespace. In Dell EMC Parse Store, we took this integration one step farther. If we now go to the Parse Store UI and navigate to the Compute UI, we can find the new MySQL instance I've just created as part of the Compute objects. We can get full visibility of the capacity, compute, and storage performance metrics of that specific pod. And because each persistent volume is a VVOL, the guest OS file system is the native file system of that container. It is not a VMDK sitting on top of another file system such as VMFS or NFS. Each VVOL is a first class citizen, meaning it is independent of the other VVOLs, LANs, or volumes. As a result, VVOLs match very well with first class disks, which are disks not requiring an associated virtual machine. VVOLs also allow for a much larger scale than traditional volumes, up to 64K per host. Plus, you don't need to manage LANs or volumes. If we take a look at the parse store array, we will see four new additional virtual volumes created. There is one config vivol representing the catalog directory. This catalog contains the metadata that tracks the FCDs on a data store. We will see one catalog created per data store when FCDs are provisioned on that data store. In addition, we have one config vivol representing the FCD directory. Then we have two additional vivols, data vivol and other vivol. The data vivol is the VMDK file and the other vivol is the VMFD file. This is a sidecar metadata file that we see on the data store. The size of the data vivol matches the request we made in the persistent volume claim manifest. With that, let's add some more persistent volumes and run some MySQL load on the parse store array. I added three one terabyte persistent volumes and started the load. At this point, if we go back to the compute tab, we can see that more volumes are now attached to that pod with a total of almost three terabyte. If we navigate to the storage performance tab, we can see very useful information such as the latency, read and write and average, IOPS, bandwidth, and IOS size. Now, because each persistent volume is a virtual volume on the array, we can be even more specific and get the performance metrics for each and every VVOL, including all the metrics I've just showed you. I hope you will find this demo useful and thank you very much for watching.